Hi, I'm Anne Marie O'Dell. My show is called Tarot Joy, and I am the spiritual radio host, published author, and professional intuitive reader for over 37 years. My guest today is David Ditchfield, and the name of his book is Shine On. You may look at further details on David's miraculous music and paintings at his website called shineonthestory.com. David's story is all about how a wonderful goodbye to a precious friend on a train can lead to horrendously unexpected accidents. I don't mean to laugh, but when you hear the story and of his miraculous journey, what he saw, what he experienced, and how he came back and painted it and composed music, gifts that he had no training on, and how he became what he calls the artist in the attic in a yoga building for almost two years. So here's his story. We jump right in to him explaining the accident. It's me, oh, you were so unlucky that day, you know, if you could turn the clock back, you know, and I was going, no, I, I was so lucky that day. First, because I, I survived, I survived this awful accident. But secondly, because I had this remarkable um, spiritual enlightenment, this experience, which was to change my life for, for forever, basically, and to completely awesome. open up the whole book. Yeah. yeah, and and you wrote a book on all this, right? That's right. Yeah, it's called. Do you Shine have that on. book there? No, I haven't it got you? it with me. No, <laughs> I, I, I can. I can go. Did and you grab forget a to buy a box of books? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, they're all around the place. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. I, I thought my paintings would do for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll book, have yeah. a little of those paintings in in due time here. Yeah. So, um, okay, please describe to us what exactly happened. And how does one get dragged under a train, David? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's a freak accident. It's not something that happens a lot. Let's face it. And um, what, what had happened? happened was, yeah, I was I was seeing a friend off at the at the rail station, uh, and I was helping her onto the train with her bags, and I and I gave her a hug and a kiss on the carriage, and then we heard the emergency buzzers going for the doors to close, and as I stepped back my coat got trapped in the automatic closing doors and I just couldn't pull it free. And this was like a very thick quality coat. So it was, it was not going to come out. Um, I called for help, you know, for a guard. There was no guard on the platform. I just yelled at the top of my voice, help, you know, but nobody turned up. Um, the, I heard the engines revving up on the train. I was going to say it probably a little hard to hear anything over the sound of a train. Well, no, you, they, they would have heard me. I could tell <laughs> I screamed loud enough, but yeah, yeah, yeah. when you when you think you're you're about to lose your life, you call yes, very loud, does, and yes, and I sure. I really believed at that point that I was going to die, you know, because I knew I wasn't going to come free. And when those engines revved up, you know, it was like I suddenly was aware of this, that this was a very big, powerful machine, you know, and I, it was just me, skin and bones. Was it a passenger train, David, or was yeah, it a... yeah, it was it was a passenger train. Yeah, it was a, it was an over, overline. Uh, as we call them in the UK, train. So yeah, not, not a subway. And um, so yeah, the, the engine started to rev up and then it started to pull out of the station at great speed. They really accelerate so fast. You don't realize, I do now, you know, oh, when, you, when you're when you inside- I love you just trains, get, but I do, do know you? that they can go really fast. I mean, I'm sure you don't, but, but I, I, for me, when I, I've had little experiences seeing my divorced dad, you know, on a train to sh Chicago and things. And so I remember scary images of passenger trains, but I've always been fascinated with luxury trains. But so I just, um, I feel, I feel for you. They are huge. They are powerful. They, and they don't wait. They go and that they go fast. I know. Yeah. 
exactly that's that's it, it, it so it, what happened david did you get dragged under yeah i got dragged under yeah yeah I, I i lost my footing and i was still attached to the doors and then i got pulled between the space of the platform and the speeding train and i got pulled right under the wheels and i was just thrown around like a, a relentless mm -hmm. rag doll you know is the best way to describe it and i was fully conscious throughout the whole ordeal and it was just very violent and very did horrific. time go slow did it's, it go slow yeah it's interesting um it wasn't like slow motion, but my but time stretched. It's time suddenly became like going from video video to thirty five mil film, you know, and um, and that happens. I saw I saw a scientific program quite recently um, uh, with this guy, and and uh, he's he's a neurosurgeon or, or doctor, and and he said that that happens a lot when you get guys like rock climbers, these guys who climb mountains without any ropes and stuff like that, you know, just their hands and, and, and yeah. Feet. And they're about to fall and uh, they're just hanging on and and that he said that that thing happens where the mind stretches and that and really it gives, yeah it gives even you while they're doing it without a, a death threat there's no, still... no 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 i'm talking about when they when there's a death threat when there well, when there is a death threat yeah okay. when they're just say they lose their footing and they're just about okay. to fall okay and they have to yeah. they have to pull themselves out of that situation just like me i mean i've got time i the whole accident for me took 13 and a half seconds i was told by the uk rail, rail police who investigated it now that felt more like minutes to me i thought it went on for minutes i you know how much i, I had time to think this through that as the train was pulling out i i remembered seeing this news item a couple of weeks ago a uh, bit previous to this, about a small child being thrown from a burning apartment block. And when this child landed, it didn't break any any bones or limbs. And they put that down to the fact that the infants relax themselves. They're not, they don't tense up like we do. So I thought, right, do that, relax. So I had all these thought things going, you know, so I was going into fight mode rather than flight as well. So I was determined to survive. And uh, anyhow, I, when I went under, as I say, it was just like being going into the into the. But you didn't gates get of hell. squished. I didn't, didn't get, get squished, but I got I got mashed <laughs> and messed up, and I my left arm yeah, got, yeah. got severed, and uh, you know, so I, I got very much caught up in in the, in the mechanics of the wheels and everything. Right. I ended up in between the tracks as the train was still continuing on. It's a very long train. Wow. And even then, I thought. I thought 007, you got it. What would happen now in this stage? He would keep his head right down. That's what and you're so thinking, 007? I was thinking that. That is the truth. <laughs> and so I uh, said, right, keep your head down, for goodness sake. So I did. Because, and you know, something could have just come and whacked me, and that would have been it, the speed it was going at. And uh -huh. it, it moved on eventually. And there I was lying on the track uh, with my left arm completely ripped open and severed um, in complete agony. But also in a sense of joy that I'd survived. I couldn't believe it. So yeah, so that was that. That was, that's what going under a train is like. And yes, it's, it's, that's how it happened. Uh, my coat getting trapped. So at weird. that point, were you experiencing the other side or no, what was I didn't going do on? No, I, 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 the, the, Paramedics arrived pretty quick and they kind of cut through my clothes and got me in into an ambulance and into hospital. And it was when I arrived in the hospital, uh, all the surgeons and doctors were wor working on me and I was losing copious amounts of blood by this point. And, uh, and I, I, I was worried that, it, that I wasn't going to pull through to be honest with you because I could see how frantically worried and concerned they were. You know, there's all these science figures going over my head, they're going, give me an E45. No, 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 give me a 45, six. I was going, what, what are you talking about? You know, and I thought, oh, this is So good. were you astral projecting at that point, kind no, of? No, I was, no, I was, I was still fully just me in pain, okay. in so agony. So you were still hearing all this? Life. So I was yeah. hearing them, yeah. And I was just scared for my life at that point. And then it was at that point that I did, I did leave my body. And I, I left from the, the, all the franticness of the hospital and and the bright lights and 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 the, the agony, the sheer agony. And then I suddenly found myself in a much calmer and more beautiful and uh, darkened place, like a but not a foreboding darkness, like a really beautiful, calming darkness. And kind I of thought, like your jacket, kind of like your jacket, a little like my jacket. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. And um, so. Um, I've carried the theme on clearly, haven't I? <laughs> so, so yeah, so there I was 
in this darkened space, which I thought was a, a, a room at first, you know, because I didn't know where I was. I figured that I died. I figured I hadn't survived it and that I'd moved on to the next stage. But interestingly enough, I, I went with it. I didn't try and fight it. I mean, I've since read other accounts and heard other accounts of some people who do uh, cross over to the other side and they resist it. They want to come back because they've got their kids and stuff like that. I mean, I didn't want to die, don't get me wrong, but I was so happy to have got away from the actual trauma that I'd just been through and sure. being uh, feeling so peaceful. So I looked around me and I, and I, and I was kind of welcomed by these beautiful orbs, uh, like these lovely coloured orbs that were just slowly pulsating all around me, uh, kind of at my level. And they made me feel kind of comforted. And so I just kind of started to relax and then get my bearings. I looked around and I realised that I was no longer laid on, my, on a hospital trolley, but what I was laid on was this, uh, like a, a slate rock. It was like a huge, like a medieval altar, if you like. And I was just laid wow. out on it. Yeah, I know. And, um, <laughs> uh, and it was very comfortable. Um, despite the fact that I was no longer wearing clothes, it didn't matter. I was just covered by this blue satin sheet. But I felt really comfortable on this rock. So I just thought, I just laid back and... Um, as I did, I was lying there and I, I just saw these like three grids of white light that were just kind of closing in on me. And, uh, and as I looked into that light, the light was so pure that the energy of that pure white light was just felt very strong. And I couldn't take my gaze away, even though it was like an intense light. Uh, and I just thought, wow, this is, I knew I was being healed by that light. And so I, it was a beautiful feeling. Ah, and um, you thought you were being healed. That's what I felt like I was being healed by that light. Yes, yes. So I, as I lay there, then I suddenly felt the presence of somebody. I thought somebody has suddenly arrived at this scene. So I lifted my head and there was uh, just right at my feet. Um, there was like this um, androgynous being, a really beautiful being with this work. I have to, you know, that is so strange because everybody that I know that has usually, you know, people that have had experiences in which that it has taken them artistic levels. It seems as if they always perceive the person as androgynous, you oh, know, really? kind of like oh. Krishna. Krishna, you know, <laughs> was kind of a, a sense of the, um, that androgynous kind of uh, symbol. So yeah, interesting. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Go. Not at all. That's, that's, that's very good, interesting knowledge for me, I think, to learn um affirmation and so yeah um so yes yeah, so i i looked at this being and he or she was just wearing a very contemporary black t-shirt you know nothing too ethereal or oh, anything that, like and that, you're yeah. on an altar and they're in a the t-shirt <laughs> exactly yeah that's it you know and so i so i like that because i felt this was like because the whole experience felt so ultra real. And I felt I knew that I was there and it wasn't a, a, a dream or a hallucination. This was happening. I was there in this space. And I love the fact that this being was just wearing a, a black T-shirt. And he or she just kept grinning at me and smiling with a knowing smile. Wow. And I, was, I know, it's amazing. And I, I just felt protected as well. And I said, mm -hmm. I know you. Who are you? I know your face. Where do I know you from? And uh, he or she just kept grinning back at me. And, and it's, it was like that feeling that, you know, sometimes you go to a party and you meet somebody for the first time, and you get chatting and you both turn around and say, I feel like I've known you all my life. And it was right. like that moment, you know, that one of those moments, but a lot more intense. I suddenly realized that I'd known this, this uh, being throughout the whole of my you, life and beyond. Yeah. Uh, just an idea, but do you think it was yourself? Yeah. I think it was my higher self. I think it was right. my higher consciousness. Exactly. Self. And of course it was smiling at you. It's like, hey, dude, you <laughs> finally found me. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you're going to find out. You're going to see, you're going to suss this one out yourself, basically, aren't you? You're going to get right. it, you know? Right. But not only would you, that. Would you, would you define that as angelic? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I would define it as angelic. So even though it is of your higher self, you still, you still, perceived that that was an angel of sorts yeah because there, there were other forms that, that have appeared that were all i would also call angels you know well i call them i don't actually call them them my angels i call them my my guides 
So they're right. my guides. So they're my spirit guides. Potato, so, potato. Guess, you know, I mean, no, whatever. no, no, exactly. But, but, I want to call them spirit yeah. guides or, or angels or, you know, I, I'm agreeing with you, by the way. Yeah, sure. But the reason I say that, the reason I'm putting that across is because I kind of figure that, that makes more sense in a sense that, that, that we've got our own individual guides that are attached to us that, that I knew that these guides have been with me throughout the whole of my life. And I just hadn't, I just ignored it. I've not ignored it. I just hadn't acknowledged it. And now I, I have, and I know they're still with me. They're a part of me because they're an extension of, of my, my sort of earth spirit, if you like. Me you had a on, rare on opportunity to meet all of you. Yes, indeed I did. Yeah. So that's what I meant. So it was a so, experience to meet them. So let me see, is the painting behind you, um, is that one in which you were on the altar? Yeah, I'll just tip this back a bit there so you can see it a bit more. So, so yeah, so that's the very first painting I did, actually. But I did that as soon as I, can, I, I could. <laughs> when I, I'd got out of the hospital, I was recuperating at my sister's house. And then I started on that canvas. I've never done anything like this before. And I just wanted to paint. So you had never bit. painted before? No, I mean, I was when I was a kid, I was I was really interested in drawing, and I loved drawings and things like that. But I never pursued it because of my I was dyslexic at school, so that meant all my grades were very low, and I left as I say, absolutely I left college, understand. So I, was, mm -hmm. so I was never pushed into anything into anything mm -hmm. academic, i.e., going to art school and stuff like that right. to do all this. So I never did, but. Um, yeah so but I just suddenly felt that I'm going to do this I when I was it was like the first night and after I come in hospital that I come through from the anesthetic from eight hours of operation I thought what has just happened to me you know and I've got to record this before I forget it all <laughs> so I was scared I would forget it. obviously I've never forgotten it so that very first painting is the one that I did and it's pretty much got everything in it because I just wanted to cram everything in there you know so I was so I'm it. laughing I'm laughing because now I'm an old hippie and uh I used to feel that way sometimes on hallucinogenics. I have to write this down. I have to be able to put it here because this phenomena that I have just realized has got to be written down so that I never, ever, ever forget. And of course, I could never paint like that. I could, and if I did look at it later, it wouldn't make the same meaning to me, but this is obvious to see that you had your own hallucinogenic and it naturally, and that you are uh, able to record it, not only by talking about it, writing about it, but how wonderful that you can put it right there in front of us. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was my quest. I just thought I've got to do it. You know, I started, I've done others as well, other paintings that, that to reflect what was there, because I just, as I say, when I first came back from the actual experience itself, I just thought, why have they sent me back? And what I'm, I've obviously got a mission. I've got I've got something to do here. And first of all, I figured that it was it was caring for people. And when I was in hospital, I was in there for a long time. And once I was able to start walking around the the, the wards, I used to go up and try and help people who are sick in their beds. But I realized that actually wasn't my mission. That wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. And what I was supposed to be doing was creating art and music and telling my story uh, about you know not only what i had seen in the afterlife but how it can how we can how we can use it to live our lives without having to go through that experience and so so yeah so so so, so. yeah you know i often feel that way about um suicide you know, it's too bad that people can't just have that moment like you did and be able to experience it without having to completely leave our their life, you know. Yeah. And uh, so you had that rare glimpse of what many people that die ever, you know, they, I don't know. Anyway, so now comes the question. I have been... Um, best friends with a victim uh, that was potated in a car accident and the other best friend was with her um, because she was in shock. She didn't even know she went through it until later. Mm. I strange that after the accident, 
it seemed as if we all parted and we never saw each other again because it just seemed like the drama of that accident changed everybody's lives so much. Mm. I'm wondering with you after this accident, did you find that you still maintained old friendships or were you now more highly tuned? Did you ping a different whale sonar? Did you attract mm -hmm. a different kind of people? Were your old friends necessarily of your frequency anymore? Um, that's a really good question, I say, because uh, no one's asked me that. <laughs> and in all fairness, right after the accident itself, uh, all my friends, I know, obviously, they were concerned for me, but I just felt like I got the the closest bond I'd ever had with them, all of them at that point, and everyone was really with me. And everybody was really keen to hear the story when I talked about it, and everybody got it. You know, friends were coming to visit me in hospital from London because I was, I was in hospital in Cambridge, which is, you know, um, about an hour away. Anyway, so they'd come in, and they'd, they were all saying, David, you're glowing. You've got this, this light coming from you, so, and, and stuff. And, and I said, well, I, they, you know, and I explained what had happened. Anyway, that's another story. But those friends, yeah, we, we remained friends for quite some time, and, I, and, I, and most of them are still my friends. Yeah, some of us have drifted apart naturally, but that's because we've moved to different parts of the country. You know, so we were all, we were all condensed the... into London. At the accident point. did not change your mentality not mine, to where no. you, yeah. It, it didn't do, no, because it, the reality is, is that, uh, like I said to you very early on, that I, I didn't see it as a negative, the accident. I didn't see it as a thing that I, I want to put behind me, that it was a horrible day. I see. You know, to me, that for me, the, uh, the whole thing I attached to it is, is the positivity that came out of it, the beauty that came out of it. And it filled me with a lot of self-love. And because I'd suddenly found that self-love, obviously when you've got self-love, it, it's easy to love everyone around you. So, so there was no sense of like, oh no, I'm not on that same frequency anymore, you know? Right. There's, yeah, so that's- But um, have you found that you also attract people that you would have never attracted before? Do you find that your frequency is changed somewhat? Because yeah. I do believe people are like whales. You know, we each emit a different frequency and dependent totally. on the um, amount of amount of whatever you have gotten into, people always know they can attract. So I just wondered if you felt that somewhere along the way you were bringing in like-minded people more, um, you know, on that level of artistic, yeah. uh, you know, Absolutely, no, no. I, I've, I've really noticed that. I mean, I noticed straight away that a lot of synchronicity came into my life that had and never been there what before. Explain what that, what by, in what way? Well, for example, I, I would just, um, you know, I would when I first started started doing the paintings. Uh, I didn't know where I was going to paint them. I got nowhere to go, you know. And uh, then a friend of my sister's happened to visit one day, and and I told her what was going on, and she said, "Well, look." We, my husband and I run a yoga Pilates center and we've got a spare studio for the week. Why don't you come down there and you can start your painting? So I did. And that's where I started this one. And obviously by the end of the week, it wasn't finished. And so she said, mm -hmm. yeah, you can stay, we'll move you around. And I ended up staying there for two years with that free wow. of charge, okay? And the energy just from me being in that place suddenly opened up because people coming into the yoga Pilates groups got to know me as the artist in the attic and they used to come up and say, hey, you should go and check this guy out. And so there was a, I, a lot of people got into the, the whole spiritual aspects of my paintings. And then I met a cello player and we, we became friends. And then I started writing music and then that piece of music suddenly became something that was definitely needed to be performed by an orchestra even though i've never written a, a single note of musical notation i still don't um but that all came about and so much synchronicity came into making that all happen and it was performed by the orchestra and it went on to be a sellout concert uh, which was great but there was a reason for that because again synchronicity started to happen you know i the, the orchestra guy said oh would you mind just saying a few words to the local press because you've written this piece I said yeah sure and I spoke to them and it just happened that the person I spoke to said I remember you you're the guy who went under the train yeah you know I saw that <laughs> and, 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 the, and, the, and so this is going on the front page so that went from front page to my phone ringing so the BBC saying we want to come and interview you at the rehearsal 
so the it sold out two two weeks in advance so so this is synchronicity and this is so new people started coming to my life that i suddenly found that i was connecting with for the first time because I, I never used wow. to connect very well before when i say i was doing um uh, you know manual laboring work Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, I was not very good at that kind of work. It, that was not for me. I, that, I loved those guys. We got on great. We had lots of fun. Mm -hmm. but I never connected with them because they were their frequency was totally different to mine. You know, they were right. brilliant right. at their work and I wasn't. <laughs> so right. all of a sudden I was like now surrounded by people who are creative, who are working in, in orchestras, and these are not well, who you would have hung out with at all no, before. No, not at all. Yeah, not not at all. You know, I was just hanging out in the local pub, in the local bar, with my with my mates every day after working on a building site, and which was lovely. But you know, now I was like suddenly starting to open up like uh, like a flower, if you like. You know, I'm thinking, wow, mm. this is. It, and it felt like that. I felt like I was just kind of going opening up, and all the I could hear my ribs cracking. <laughs> I was like, yes, you know, awesome. here we go. Awesome. So um, at this point, if someone were to say, David, tell me what is on the other side. If someone said, David, tell me what to expect. Okay, yeah. What would you well, tell them? Well, you're gonna, well, you will expect unconditional love for us to first start off and then you will ex experience um you the pure essence of your soul for the first time in your life you will you experience the fact that um the past no longer exists the future no longer exists there's no time at all and and that is a great point to be at and you'll feel that all the layers of of guilt or whatever you carry whatever baggage you have it's gone, it's all dispersed. And it's just you, your pure soul, the pure, beautiful soul that you've got inside you. And it's and that's it's a really wonderful feeling to have that. And it and it's and it will it will teach you an awful lot. Like it's taught me a lot about self-love. Um but also for me and for most people, a lot of people will see a tunnel, a tunnel of white light. And I saw that. Did and you that as a yeah, and it's a very powerful. Uh, experience. It was the most profound part of the whole NDE because for me, I because there was a lot of telepathy coming through throughout the whole experience, and I was being told at that point that I was when I was looking at this powerful white light coming towards me, it was surrounded by all these flames that were just turning around. Is that what you're painting there, David? Yeah, that's that's right at the back. You know, you can see them. At the, I, mm -hmm. As I say, I'll put everything in there, so that's at the very back. Right. And you can see all the flames are surrounding that that intense white light. Now that white light is just the energy coming from that was just pure, absolute, unconditional love, and it was just so powerful that every molecule in my body was vibrating with this love. And I, what I, I knew that I was looking at me personally was I was was um, the source of all creation. You know, this was God that I was, I was now looking at. Yeah, this was like. Um, you know, and what, and you know what's nice about that theory, David? Hmm. You could be Christian. Muslim, yeah. Buddhist, whatever you are. And that light would symbolize whatever it is that is the source of love for your religion. Yeah, so, so that is also a beautiful thing. Although I do notice that Jesus is on the other He's side. Over there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. He, he comes into another part of the story. Yeah, so he came okay. later. But um, yeah, but you're absolutely right because. You know, if you think about it, most images we see painted or, or depicted of God, they're always in some kind of human form, whatever faith. You know, there's always some kind of human element to it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas to me, this was it. This was a source of all creation. This was the, this right. tunnel of white light. This is where it light, comes from. light, yeah. and light, the light. And light, light is the source of all creation. Totally, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's it really is. So, um, so yeah, so, so so I that's what you will from other people who've had I, I know have had NDEs that's what that's what you'll experience yeah mm, so you're you've tuned into something that 
any, well, I, yes, I believe almost anybody does have an afterlife experience, although some say that they haven't, that they don't remember having any, but I think of that as the same people who can't remember their dreams. You know, everyone mm. dreams, yet a few will say, no, 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 I never dream. And I'd say, yes, you did, or you'd be insane. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. the so. the thing is, in the same way, I believe that some people say, well, I didn't have an experience. I just think of it as that same essence that doesn't remember a dream. Things, things symbolic become so uh, powerful and sometimes threatening that it begins to be something people try to forget after they come back from whatever um, dream or death situation. But that doesn't mean that we're not all experiencing one when we leave this earth or so go on david tell me more yeah well i mean i mean ultimately i mean it's just um it's it's the next stage it's it, it's it's basically what i realized was was that you know the soul is too much of a powerful entity just to switch off when we die the body dies and that's it and that decays but the soul moves on to the next stage of the journey and that's where i went to that next stage you know, I'm, I, I lost my mother um, last summer and... Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, thank you. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, when that happened, you know, it's as soon as she'd gone, I knew, I, was, I just actually said to her, I, I spoke to her uh, you know, when I was in the hospital and she asked her she died and I said, well, mum, you're going to love it where you are now. I know exactly where you are and you're going to love it. And I, and I had that complete ultimate faith of the, and happiness and joy what was you know, her she'd gone there what oh that you said that after she died I said, no oh gosh no i said it after yeah i didn't say it beforehand yeah I'd well said it after, i mean i think she, that would be comforting she, to know oh and no i'd love to be able to tell everybody just before they die most certainly but in my mother's state she had a a, a, a heart attack and a massive heart attack so it wasn't something that she was lying there on a deathbed right. or so so but what i mean is you know when you a lot of us go to say goodbye to to our loved ones after just after they died so it was just a sort of final farewell that's when i said it to her you know. right. and um uh do you know what's really amazing as well i just i remember i leant across and i just kissed her forehead to kiss her goodbye and as i did i felt like this jolt um from her uh, into my heart chakra right from her and it was like oh <laughs> it's kind of like wow, wow. it's like this kind of acknowledgement that 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 um, after I just said that to her, that you're gonna love it where you are now. That was like, it was almost like a beautiful reply, you know, it was really nice. But yeah, but what I'm trying to say is that my faith is that, and my belief of what happened is so, so strong that that when losing my mother, who I loved dearly, that it was, uh, it really helped me so much to know. I mean, obviously I missed her and I still do miss her physical presence, but, you know, just to know that fact that that's that's that she was on to the next stage of the journey was just um, was just really beautiful. And, uh, and so I try to sort of really help people along with that, not just because a lot of people fear death as well, and which is understandable because we don't talk about death doing it in Western civilization. No, it, it's like going to a party where you don't know anybody. Well, yeah, it is. And it's like, or I compare it to the fact that we prepare for everything else in life. We prepare for birth, marriage, driving tests, but we don't prepare for death, you know? And so we may as yeah. well just touch on it. We don't have to. Well, we can buy our, we can buy our plot and we can buy our stone, but we can't buy a, we can't buy a loophole to heaven. So. Yeah, um, well, yeah I know. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be nice for people to try and actually think, oh, you know, I wonder, where, I wonder what happens next. I my insurance, my insurance, <laughs> I'm going to get to heaven. Yes. <laughs> or the two. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah um go on yeah um i, I forgot what, I, <laughs> I got distracted the there <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we're, we're, no, we're I, supposed to answer the next. okay <laughs> yeah so basically um your mom and yeah. and what i said was um and we talked about whether she was going to whether she had heard you say knowing you experienced that yeah. she knew you knew what you were talking about so therefore um yeah, you I know it must have been that. comforting to her to know that or to the people that come to you afraid of death and and there are a lot of people of death and that's what that's where we took off was fear of yeah, death sure okay fear okay of death. yeah so so there's an awful lot of fear of death because as i say people don't 
we don't talk about it enough. So the, I can understand it if you if if it's you know you don't know anything about near death experiences or spirituality, it can be really frightening just to think that wow you know that's it I'm I'm not going to see my loved ones again and or what have you or just you know that life just going to finish and it's all over you know. And it's and and you're right. I mean, as civilized people, we have been spared. Uh, unless you've been in war or you've been a soldier or you've been a victim of war. Um, it's very easy to, to not relate, understand, or have had any experience with death. And so, um, whereas other countries, some countries at least, seem to take a more natural uh, viewpoint about being with dying loved ones or I, I don't know it just seems like yeah. indigenous people especially I haven't got exactly. the yeah, fear of example. of of these other people that are the fine christians and the fine you know that <laughs> don't you know what i'm saying yeah. i'm not no sure. totally I'm, I'm, I'm with you completely on that so yeah, indigenous yeah. yeah so indigenous have kind of had it um a privilege knowing that they will never have to worry about the fear of death because it's like waking up it's like going to work it's like part of life yeah but but also if you think about it compared to, compared to the indigenous lifestyle you know we're, we're all about high achieving aren't we we're all about kind of i want to get to this point where i've got enough money then i can pay off my mortgage then i can get a new car then i can do this then i can retire and what's the when stock I market retire, doing <laughs> yeah, what's the stock market doing? But this thing that, that everyone's aiming for, they're saying, then once I've done all this, then I can retire, then I can enjoy life, then I can just take it easy. And it's kind of like, that's that's such a, if you think about it, that's just such a, a bonkers way mm -hmm. to sort of live your life, isn't it? Because it, you're just constantly is. sort of having this idea and this map of plan. We, we can't plan our lives out. We're when so... we do get to that stage, we don't know if it's going to be enjoyable. We know how to multitask. We, we just do, don't know how yeah. to lay down and die. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's just one of those things that um, I don't know. So mm. you were going to tell me about the painting be behind you, Jesus. Sure. Yeah, Jesus. Right. That, so um, I'll tilt that up a bit so you can see. Him. There he is. Um, so that came about. Um, I, I found a spiritualist church um, near where I was living and uh, and I, I wanted to go and chat to them because I thought they may get the story about what's happened, you know, and they did. As soon as I walked in, I talked about it and they said, oh, you had a near-death experience. I was going, oh, great, you know, so we, we got chatting and they said, you look pretty banged up at the moment, you know, you're all, your arms in a mess and stuff. And they said, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've got this plaster holding you together. And they said, we do spiritual healing. Would you like to come along? I said, I'd love to. So I started having spiritual healing. Now, spiritual healing is really beautiful. It's a very calm uh, sort, of ex uh, sort of experience where you just, you lay out on a bed and, and, and you have two or three healers working on you. And it's very similar to what uh, that happened to me. I was going to say, the, the hands very are out, similar yeah. to your experience there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so the, the, the healers basically channel through energy from my guides and from their guides and they bring through the healing light and, and it comes through their hands and into various parts of the body that need healing is it reiki it's not reiki no it's spiritual it's not healing. reiki it's, uh, these guys have okay. to so, you know they have to be fully affiliated you know they train and make a healing license, touch so. it's the healing touch it's, it's, but it, i think it's very similar to reiki i've never had reiki but i'm I, it is mm -hmm. similar to that yeah and um so so yeah and um, so that i started going there and a, and a couple of the healers were clairvoyant and they turn around at the end they just say a few messages like oh i saw this beautiful sort of blue light coming through as i was healing you and then they started saying why am i seeing you know this and that and the other and then and then one week i was being healed and then i saw while i was being healed a, an image of christ like i painted him there just floating above me with this beautiful white tunic on, looking really healthy, and you know, not the usual image of Christ on the cross. This was him looking like probably like the resurrection, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, and he was just staring at me, and I just thought this is beautiful. And I came after that session finished. We just sat there as we always do. We don't talk for a while. And then one of the healers turned around and said, "David, you know that I, I saw Christ stood next to you while I was healing you," and I was going wow that's amazing you won't believe it but and i said what i'd seen so of course i had to go back home 
and st- buy a canvas and get straight onto that. And painted it. Yeah, and painted it. Yeah, and uh, there it is. Would you say that your favorite color is blue? Yeah. <laughs> Would you say that there's a reason for that? There's, there's, I, there is. I think, I think that, um, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not clairvoyant, so I don't see a spirit. But I do get little signals that I know that when I've got spirit with me, or I've got people, my guides close to me, and every now and again, I get this little flash of blue light that I see in my eye, and and it's there and it'll stay with me. And that color of that blue is is similar to the color of the blue that was in the in the sheet that covered me. And right. And I guess it's, I don't aim to sort of use a lot of blue in my paintings. It just happens to come through, and I notice it afterwards. I think because I'm guided when I'm when I'm painting, I'm channeling through. So I, half the time, I don't I don't even choose the colours that go on the canvas. So yeah, I, well, I do notice. It's 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 also interesting to me that many uh, religions like uh, Krishna and um, other Chinese, you know, uh, religions, many of their um paintings of their deities or whatever are blue or they're pale blue so it seems to be that blue is a very spiritual uh color it seems to be i don't know i just yeah, I, yeah. and i noticed you mm-hmm. use a lot of it you're yeah. wearing it i'm wearing it yeah. so it just mm-hmm. seems to be that blue is is in your paintings a lot yeah. um I'm just going to ask you, um, tell me what your favorite painting is. Is it one of those? Is it? Um... Um, sure. Now I ask yeah, that. Just, you haven't no, no, got no, it these, with you. They're just, yeah, they're, they're like, they're these, the, some of these paintings I keep, I'm never going to sell them. Right? And they're, they're like my kids. Yeah, they're like, so, right. you, you know, if you've got kids, you don't sort of turn around and say, oh, yeah, he's my favorite or she's my favorite. You love Are you still painting? Yeah. Oh yeah, I still paint a lot. Yeah, yeah, I'm still painting. And what is and your soul? What is your uh, what is your main um, theme when you paint? And I will talk about your music next. Yeah, um, well, it depends. I mean, of late, it's been uh, more spiritual. Uh, my my paintings. Um, I think a, a lot of that has to do is because since the book uh, came out, I've been doing interviews, talking to people like yourself, and 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 it feels like the energy has opened up to like. A, a bigger audience and it's opened me up and suddenly my spirituality is kind of like the radar is a lot wider now so I'm feeling really drawn to do everything that I do is very very much based on on, on my spiritual journey awesome. I'm writing a piece of music as well and that's a new piece which is and what is the stronger. where now are you have a website where people yeah. can listen to your music that's right yeah. and see your paintings and what is that again David that's called shine on the story.com and you have a book yeah which is called shine on so so that's shine, yeah, on. shine on okay yeah. so i mean that's that uh, yeah people want to buy that that's on you can get it through amazon really easy that's where you know that's the main platform where everyone's going to and it's it's picking up great reviews and people are enjoying it and getting something from it because i think they're not just getting not just the the spiritual aspects of it they're getting because the, the story is all about you know the fact that i, I me i was down on my luck i was down to my last penny you know and um, then my life turned around and opened up and it's it's so it's a kind of like you know it's a good feel good story as well you know it's just right. it's so i guess people are liking it from that point of view yeah well i think in this time and day where there's so much death um with the covid and things like that um do you have any any kind of uh, theory on that as far as the evolution of man yeah. or the times? Do you feel anything about that? Yeah, absolutely. I do. Yeah. Um, what do you I, feel about I, the COVID? I, I and just feel that, yeah, I, I, when I feel that um, it's something that needed to happen. I know it's awful that people have died and we've lost loved ones, but you know that has to happen sadly. But throughout evolution, I mean, there's been worse. I mean, there's been the ice age, you know, there's been the bubonic plague, the Spanish sure. plague, which took far more lives, you know, and and people were unable to help themselves. And now we've got more technology to be able to save lives and stuff. And um, so yes, yeah, so I, I believe that it happened for a reason. I mean, I just felt that the, the, the this planet, our beautiful Mother Earth was being really tested and, and we were just coming to tipping point. 
So the fact that it happened is kind of no surprise, you know. And um, I felt it I, when it first happened. It, to me, it just felt like the the earth had just kind of like stopped, and it had just gone like that, you know. You know, if a, if a big truck stalls, it just felt like that. And the energy kind of felt really strange at first. And uh, well, when when we hit twenty twenty, um, I felt as a positive minded person that twenty twenty was going to be a monumental year of peace. Oh my God, was I wrong? But then again, not because it no. still is a monumental year, and it doesn't mean that it won't change the mentality of people. It has kind of changed sometimes for the worse, but on the other hand, um, I don't think that people will ever, I hope as, as an American, I hope that people will not take sides as to whether it represents a political party that you believe that there is actually a pandemic when it thousands and thousands of people are dying all over the world. No, um, of course, yeah. I mean, and, I, and, but it has in America taken such strange um, turn. And, but I know that uh, I think that it's something like you say, it's going to make a change. Um, so you can't have an entire population wiped out like that without saying that we're starting from scratch in a way, you well, know? I don't think we're going to get wiped out a whole entire population. I really don't, you know. I mean, th th we have to be careful of the media, you know. There's one thing that's come out of all this, and we're all, well, I think we're all realising it now, that media frenzy mm -hmm. is, is something that's been there for so long and we've never really noticed it. Well, I certainly haven't. And now I'm thinking... Do you know what's this crazy? They're feeding, they're just kind of like, just feeding us with hysteria constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. There, there's no, nobody wants to get a positive story out, out of the whole situation. So what do you, what is your theory? So what, what is your suggestion to a media frenzy population? Is to stop, is to just take it in a little dose. That's what I do. Don't, I mean, most of us switch on the news when, as soon as we wake up and put the coffee on. And that's not a good way to start your day, you know, because that's no. like putting you straight into like, oh, kind of mode. It's not <laughs> allowing our bodies to just kind of stretch out and go, ah, oh, right, let's, what a beautiful day. Wow, the sun looks uh, uh, fantastic today or whatever, you know. So I'm just saying, yeah, don't ignore the news. Don't sort of pretend that it's not happening. But you, if you notice it, that if you watch one news headline at one part of the day, You've got it, and that's all you need to know. If you switch it back on again four hours later, it's the same. Ten hours later, it's you're the same. right. It doesn't change. It, no. it, yeah. So as long as they can get people um, the bad yeah. news they need to exactly. stay interested, not, then they can chew on that bone, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. But but anyway, so that's just one side of it. But I think the other thing to to look at as well, which I saw happen myself, I don't know about you, but especially in the UK, that when we when we all went into lockdown, that People at oh. first panicked, but then they started to... Oh, the arts opened up again. Exactly, yeah. They started becoming creative. They started baking their own bread, teaching their kids at home, and, and then getting in touch with nature. People were going online saying, hey, have you seen, you should look out. You, I'm, I'm in the garden now. There's these amazing birds that land in, and they just come and they eat the bread, and then they go, it's like, oh, yeah, at last you've discovered this, you know. <laughs> but... So our garden the, shops, our our garden shops were sold out within a few weeks when they opened yeah. up in the warm weather. Um, people were seen in families riding bicycles together on the streets. Exactly. You know, they yeah. and it was like these are things that people hadn't seen since the fifties, and and yeah. now yeah. all of a sudden they were it was happening again. Yeah. Um, and pets, oh my gosh, pets were thriving. Thing. For the first time, they weren't shut in the house alone. They got to be able to be an actual family member, um, yeah. you know. So yes, it, it was all it, exactly. It so, was so, a spiritual so that's the movement. positive that came it out of it. Really it, it was, was. It was exactly to me. It felt it felt very close to my my own experience of like when I came back from that near death experience that I realized that I was able to stop and be in the moment, you know, and stop and appreciate things. And I thought, great, everyone's starting to do that now. I mean, I just want to say one thing that I'm not underplaying the whole thing. I mean, I've, I've, I've got two family members who both had COVID, so I know the reality of it. You know, I'm not trying to brush this over. It's so, yeah, 
it, it, it is, but you know, like I say, and sadly, the, the, we need adversity, don't we? Well, I say we don't need it. Adversity often brings a new horizon, is what I should say. And I think that something positive will come out of this. That's, that's what I feel anyway. I think a lot of people are here saying, oh, we just want to get back to normal. And I'm saying, why? There, there, there's no yeah. going Was back. Was normal that good? Why, we don't yeah. want to go back. What do you want to go back to? Why don't you just say, yeah. how about we learn something from this? We actually learn that we... We're in, I'm seeing families that are enjoying just being in their own bubble now. And I'm. do you know what my prediction is? That a lot of people are going to be quite nervous of going back into like big parties, big you know, office blocks and being surrounded by hundreds of people day in, day out. I think people aren't going to want that anymore. I think people are just going to be want to be semi-reclusive and just work from home and be with their families, you know. That's right. <laughs> well, David, I want to say it's been delightful. And um, if there was any last words that you have to say to anybody about where you are now compared to where you were, um, in 2006, sure. is there a uh, is there any kind of um, what do you say? Okay, what I would say was if anyone is in in the sort of place that I was at in my life where you don't feel like anything's working and you're trying to push doors open and they're not opening, actually try and stop and stop doing that and just take some time, take some time out just to look into yourself and give yourself some self-love. The way to do that is to, we've all got an inner child within us, which is that little kid that we we knew when we were little. And try and look back and visualize that child and try and give that child some love and hug that child and then start to then realize that that is the authentic you and then ask that authentic you where it actually wants to go in life. And then you'll find that suddenly doors will slowly open and those doors are the right ones that are meant for you and you might not even realize that that, that they were where they're taking you where you were supposed to go but they will do and it's a much better path because it's your authentic path and it's much more enjoyable love it david thank you thank you bye-bye <laughs> thank you for having me